since we're just going to run through real fast, today's presentation will last approximately 60 minutes with some extra time for Q&A. HRsimple.com is an HRCI approved provider and a SHRM recertification provider. At the end of this webinar, we'll get you your codes if you attended this for that. We encourage you to enter your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them when we can. A recording and slides will be emailed to all registered attendees after this presentation. We're also posting our webinars at youtube.com slash hrsimple. And now for some quick background info on Ed Folk. Ed Folk is a partner in the Atlanta and Washington, D.C. Office, offices of Fisher Phillips. He co-chairs the firm's workplace safety and catastrophe management practice group. Prior to joining Fisher Phillips, Ed was the Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safety and Health, named by President George W. Bush to head the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. He served from April 2006 to November 2008. During his tenure at OSHA, workplace injury, illness, and fatality rates dropped to their lowest levels in recorded history. For more than 30 years, Ed has worked in the labor and employment area focusing on occupational safety and health issues, but workplace violence risk assessment and prevention, whistleblower protection, and accident and fatality prevention. He is recognized as one of the nation's leading authorities on occupational safety and health, and is a frequent keynote speaker and lecturer on workplace safety, leadership development, and other labor and employment topics. So we have a great speaker today, uh, perhaps no one better, to uh, discuss the recent developments that have happened with OSHA, so we're very happy to have him. Uh, Ed, are you good to go? I'm good to go, and we got to get going because we got a lot to cover. All right, so let's do it. Already, we're, 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 we got we're already got a, a whole bunch of things to talk about, but I appreciate that intro, Eric, and I appreciate um, y'all doing this program uh, and putting on this program uh, with the. Uh, uh, with, with, uh, with us and uh, y'all. So I just want to kind of just say, first of all, when I, I want to because know that we got a good, we got a large number of people on here today. Um, I just want to say thank you for your commitment to safety and health. First of all, I mean, uh, I'm assuming that probably the good majority of the people that are on this line are one of two are either HR specialists or safety uh, specialists. So. Uh, and obviously the, the reason you're on this program is that you want to make sure uh, that you're doing the right thing, but also that you, you have a safe work site and that your employees go home safe and sound each and every night to your families and loved ones. And the, 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 the kind of the, the, the bad thing or the negative thing about uh, you know, on, on doing this stuff is that you, you don't get any credit. Uh, uh, on safety, uh, you know, uh, people, if you prevent an injury from occurring, someone getting injured, um, it, you, no one knows it would, ha would ever have happened, and therefore no one gets any credit for it. So that's why I wanted to say thank you for your, your commitment to safety and health, because it really is important. And to be quite frank, it's going to get more and more um, uh, critical to, um, uh, uh, to employers across the board. So, and I, I had here just kind of the questions that we should be asking here. What are the changes that increase uh, uh, all of my compliance obligations? What is my greatest exposure? What do I need to change now, this year, uh, looking to the future? You know, what are the OSHA trends? And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today and what's going on. But clearly, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit, as you notice uh, on the title there, uh, I should have included, first of all, record keeping. We do talk about workplace violence and obviously um, the shootings that the shootings that happened that happened down in Orlando is a form of workplace violence. Uh, there, were, uh, I think there was one of the deceased uh, um, uh, persons at the site was an employee of that restaurant or uh, and bar, and so uh, clearly uh, there is an exposure that we're going to see. Unfortunately, we may be seeing more and more thank you so much, uh, of this uh, occurring. So let's. Uh, we're going to be doing that, but uh, we're going to first kind of talk, you know, obviously the administration, uh, if you look at what's going on at OSHA right now, they have been, uh, they are going one thing after another after another, and I suspect we're going to see that all the way up to the end of the administration, and uh, they got their agenda, and they're going to be moving very hard. Um, 
The other thing that they've been, they have this belief, this strong belief that this uh, employers are greatly or massively underreporting workplace injuries and illnesses. And that comes, uh, you can see that basically on this new, uh, uh, the, 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 the changes that occurred last month uh, or actually going to effect in August, but the final rule was published last month, uh, which uh, on electronic filing of data, and we'll talk about or, or filing of uh, injury re reporting data. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too. And of course, you got increased citations, penalties. They're not looking at this, the number of inspections because, we, quite frankly, um, the number of inspections from when I was head of OSHA and the number of inspections they're doing now really has not really increased that much, even though uh, they actually have more, much, many more inspectors than they had when I was uh, head of OSHA. Uh, and it, it kind of, you know, uh, but the, what they have been doing is is looking at much more details on issuing, uh, making sure that they issue more citations and the penalty amounts are greatly enhanced. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, new penalty amounts, you need to understand this is something that you may not have heard of, but you'll be finding out about it because they haven't come out, it, it, officially it won't come out till April, or excuse me, August. But come August of this year, OSHA it, uh, penalties are, uh, the maximum penalties are going to increase 82%. So for a serious violation, as you can see, they're going to go for uh, other than serious uh, are going to go from 7,000 to 12,500, and willful and repeat are going to go from to 70,000 to 125,000. And the word I've been hearing from um, some of the area offices that there's been encouragement from the top, from the national office, from the politicals in the Obama uh, uh, that, are, that are there to, uh, you know, hold off on filing um, your, um, filing the, the citations until after the new penalty amounts come up, so that will automatically increase the amount of penalty amounts uh, that you're going to be issued. So we're going to be seeing how that goes. Uh, there's been clearly an update, a focus on the whistle complaints. Uh, they updated the manual. When they updated the manual, they changed the, the burden of proof to make it a lot easier for a claimant to, uh, to establish a prima facie case. Uh, and also, this is the other thing that just happened. This came out last week. Uh, there's a pilot program in Region 8, which is out in Can uh, Kansas City, I believe, is uh, out in that area, where they are doing a whistleblower severe violators enforcement program, pilot program. So they're looking at this thing to see if this is something they may do a comp uh, a nationwide where they'll put people, once again, this is the idea is they're going to shame employers uh, into in, in, in being compliant on whistleblower questions. And the whistleblower issue is even more complicated by the new changes in the record keeping, and I'll talk about that in a second, too. As a communication, uh, uh, the GSA updates, those kick in. And, of course, you know, June 1st was the uh, thing where you were, all employers were supposed to be reviewing their safety data sheets and determining, uh, doing hazard assessments to make sure that the uh, they, that the hazards that they had were uh, that were identified in the SDSs. And you got to understand these SDSs have much more information, uh, more hazard analysis than what was in the MSDSs. And so you now have other hazards that were not identified previously from the same chemical that are now being identified in the safety data sheets. So you need to be aware of that. You're supposed to update your programs and your hazard assessments to determine what hazards now you have in your work site. Uh, and that really kicked in on June 1st of this year, or this month, actually. So uh, focus on entire corporate entities. They're going after the companies. Uh, they, if, they, if there's a, one plant, they want to go and look at all the other plants. They're talking about uh, corporate-wide settlements. We'll talk about that down the road in, uh, in some of the other slides. And then they're focusing on temporary joint employer, multi-employer sites. All this stuff, once again, if you, you may be not in violation, but if you've got contractors on site that are creating hazards and you're a joint employer, you may be getting cited for the same thing. So we've got a whole series of things going on here. Uh, expanded remedies, including criminal enforcement. I got several criminal cases or, or, or referrals right now. Uh, you know, I've never had this many at one time uh, from OSHA in my, when I was there. When I was ahead of OSHA, I bet I would say we probably referred three or four cases to the Justice Department every year. I mean, I got two going on right now 
that on myself, just that I have one or two of my clients that have a, quote criminal investigations through the U.S. Attorney's Office going allegedly going on, you know, and you don't know what's going on, really to tell you. They're not going to tell you. They just kind of let alleged, they'll let you know that there's an investigation going on. So we and and they signed a memorandum of understanding. OSHA did with the Department of Justice. Uh, the national office requires all the uh, regional administrators to meet with all their U.S. attorneys in their regions and encourage them to take more cases, OSHA cases, and then there's also supposed to be meeting with all the state attorney generals in their regions, encouraging them to take criminal action against for safety violations. So this is a growing issue that, uh, you know, that we're going to be looking at there. Uh, more laws, uh, interpretation decisions by rule. Instead of doing rulemaking, uh, you know they're doing the, They just kind of put things out there, and if it sticks, it sticks. And if people complain, then that then maybe they'll, they'll pull back on it. Uh, <laughs> there's a uh, wage hour. OSHA has an agreement with wage hour. They also have a, uh, an LRB, and they also actually have one with EPA. Uh, that's the one. The criminal thing I'm dealing with right now is involving, uh, you know, the head of OSHA inspection. But somehow now they're claiming some type of uh, criminal thing uh, tied in with EPA and the Clean Air Act. So, you know, once again, there's, you know, we got these are things you got to understand. This, this is new, this is much more aggressive than they've ever been before. Uh, they're looking on, a, uh, you know, uh, enforcement. Obviously, in focus enforcement, with their executive orders, their interpretations. And you know it's going to be tough to change these things, even if uh, even if there's a change in uh, the White House when, uh, the, when the change in the White House occurs. Particularly, even with Donald Trump, if he won the election, uh, it's still going to be taking a, a really strong effort to, uh, to get make go, to get these cha things changed back to where they were originally. So, or at least get it back to a more easy something that's not so onerous on employers. Um, why uh, why OSHA is coming on site? This is a big enforcement. The enforcement actions are has been so much more aggressive than I've ever seen them. In my, and I've been doing this since 1980, so I can tell you right now there's a lot going on. Uh, the question is, you got complaints. This is what they're focusing on: uh, whistleblower retaliation. And I'll tell you, we'll talk about this the new stuff that came out on this record keeping thing. That means that you're going to have you're going to be having more investigations on this. Targeted inspections, uh, we're seeing more of those type of things. They got uh, uh, issue-driven, like uh, amputation, emphasis programs on like amputation, those type of things. And like I say, this new uh, injury reporting rules also kind of is, is fueling when OSHA shows up at your site. And this is, let's just talk about the, some of the changes on record keeping. Um, I'm going to first start one of, one of the one that's kind of a, the one that's actually kind of older than the, oh, this one was actually kicked in in 2015. And as you can see here, there were new uh, uh, reporting obligations and uh, that we had to do uh, that was, and this was a change to the record keeping standard. But basically what you have to do, um, and hopefully all of you are aware of these, but unfortunately, I'm finding, you know, I deal with a lot of my clients and new clients particularly because uh, we put out a lot of information uh, on, um, we do a lot of legal alerts on things that change for all our clients and our friends. So, but this kicked in on in back in January of 2000, last year, January of last year. And so um, you have, and you always had to report uh, within eight hours fatalities. However, there was a change in the rule in January 1st, which said that if you had a one employee, in the past it was three employees, but now if you have one employee hospitalized for a work-related incident, you have 24 hours to call OSHA. Now they may come out or they may not come out, depending on what what the information has on there, because they, they on, if it's just one person that was hospitalized, they're probably going to send you what they call a rapid response form. Do not use their form, okay? Do not use their form. Do your own investigation and reply back to them, all right? Uh, because the form asks, basically asks you to make all these admissions that don't need to be made. Uh, and then they'll, uh, based on that, they'll determine if they're going to come out. Now, if you have two or three people hospitalized, they're going to probably come out and do an inspection. The next one is if you have an amputation. 
you have tw once you have a work-related amputation, and an amputation is, is defined as the loss of a fingertip, you've got 24 hours to call OSHA. They will come out on an amputation because there's a national emphasis program on amputation. And then the last one is if you lose an eye, and this means physically the eye comes out. I've never had that. I've been doing, like I said, I've been doing this 30 years plus. I never had where somebody lost an eye, physically lost an eye. But if you have that situation occur, you've got 24 hours to call OSHA, and I suspect they're going to come out. Uh, as you can see, there were, uh, in the first year, this, in 2015, they had, you can see how many reports, uh, and, uh, and about 40% of them were inspected. And the focus is, these are, they're inspecting now places they never expect before, so we need to be aware of that. And of course, um, they have an expedited inspection process, and you have it online, you can actually report this online, uh, you, don't, uh, you can do it online or you can call in. I suggest that you call in as being a better thing. Anyway, um, and, uh, now you do not have to report an inpatient hospitalization if it's dealing with observation or diagnostic testing. So it has to be an inpatient hospitalization. They actually have to stay, be admitted into the hospital and, uh, uh, and, uh, and for care or treatment. If it's just observation or diagnosis, you don't have to call OSHA, so don't do it. Um, I also mentioned about amputations. Here's what they, they've listed there, uh, the fingertip. If it's medically, if a person has an injury uh, uh, and it, it and has to be medically amputated, uh, then you're going to have to call that in. And then once again, you have to call amputations of any body parts, even if it's been reattached. Okay, so uh, there. As I mentioned, this was public. Uh, then, then, then we got the new one. This is the new stuff that just kicked in the other day, or actually starts doesn't start till August 10th, but it's going to dramatically fit. And people have been talking about this. You've probably seen this about, oh, it's electronic filing. If you have, you know, OSHA is now requiring you to electronically file your injury and illness data. That was important, but let me tell you something. This other stuff, the first one there that kicks in on August 10th of this year, that's the big thing. And let's kind of show you a little bit here. You have to have under this new thing, and there was a requirement under record-keeping standard that you had to have a procedure and let your employees know of how they reported injury and illnesses to the employer. But now... You have to, uh, they have to uh, inform the, the right to report injuries on this, that they have that right. They have to have this procedure how to do it, and it not, cannot, that procedure must be reasonable. And that, let me put that term, I should put that term in quotes, reasonable. It has to be reasonable and not to discourage employees from reporting. And, you know, uh, and then an uh, employee cannot be retaliated against a part of the procedure or policy uh, as this a procedure has to specifically say that the employee cannot be retaliated against for reporting of work-related injuries and illnesses and that they will not be. Well, of course, we're not going to do that, but it has to be spelled out. And I've been dealing with this issue for a while because I actually have a, one of my clients has a case in federal district court where we have those, this issue came up under a whistleblower claim. And they basically, if you read the preamble or look at it, identified this, not, I don't, not, not by name, but I basically a thing there, but they said, if you have a policy right now, if you need to look at your reporting policy on reporting injuries and illness, if you have an immediate reporting policy where you say you must report immediately anytime you have an injury or illness, more likely injury, to your supervisor, uh, if you have that, that OSHA is going to consider that to be not reasonable and therefore is going to be in violation of the standard. And now, guess what? You're going to be... You're going to be uh, you're going to be hammered on this thing. Uh, you're going to be issued a citation under 1904.35. All right, um, and it, it does have the, the note. Look at this note here. This is critical. It talks about safety and, in the preamble of this thing. It talks about safety and center programs and drug testing, and they're going to be looking at these things very very closely. They come in through an inspection. Because it's under the record keeping standard, it's going to kick in every employer is required it. Even if you're partially exempt you're, from doing the 300 logs and 300 day summaries, you still have to do this. You, well, you don't have to do the, the electronic reporting, but you do have to have a procedure for reporting and they can cite you for it. And you still have the responsibilities under the 
uh, on reporting fatalities, hospitalizations, amputations, and loss of an eye. Even if you're partially exempt, you still have to call OSHA. You don't, it's, that's why they call it partially exempt. You only partially exempt from doing the 300 logs and the 300A summaries. But the problem here is now they're going to be looking at your safety incentives and Terry, does your safety incentives discourage employees from, from reporting injuries and illnesses? And if it does, now you're in violation of us and they're going to cite you. If you have a drug testing program that somehow discourages people from reporting injuries because, uh, uh, because they, you know, because they're going to be drug tested and they find out, then uh, that may be considered not reasonable. You know, and so then this is a, this is going to be developing over the next couple of months, I suspect, or maybe in the next year. But it is a complicated thing. I'm trying. To, I've been. We've been advising our clients about you know, how we need to start addressing this. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that uh, you know I, I think we're going to have we're going to have something that we can provide our clients on what how their policy should read that will meet and pass mustard on OSHA but let me tell you something you need to go back and look at it and like I say if you have a policy that says you've got to immediately report all injuries and illnesses you're probably and OSHA comes in you're going to get cited on that so you need to just be aware of that there so um, also they modified the section 1904 1904.36 to a reference 1904.35. So 1904.36 is the whistleblower provision which, which cites 11C, which references 11C. The reference is 11C. So what they've done here doing this now because of this uh, change and sector assistant, my, my successor, Dr. Michaels, said on the, you know, on the I was on the uh, stakeholder conference the day they released this, he specifically did not acknowledge this is a new cause of action that OSHA can now bring citations against employers under the under point 35 as claim that you're retaliating against employees for you know for uh, for either reporting or discouraging them from reporting. So they, that's a retaliation uh, under 11C. So now they're going to be able to cite you for this. And who knows what they're going to do during the investigation? But maybe they're going to say, oh, by the way, we think there's a violation here. Under, we're going to sign it for this, but you also have a whistleblower claim. Under 11C, you should file a complaint. Or maybe they're going to just assist them in filing the complaint. But this is, this is the issue. You know, this other stuff about the electronic filing, you know, it's, it, it's important, but it ain't as, it's not as damaging to employers as this section, these two sections are. All right, and here's the electronic filing requirements. So if you, by July 1st, you have, if you have 200, uh, uh, of 17, if you have 250 employees in one establishment, and note this is you're, if you're not if you're partially exempt under the record keeping, this doesn't apply to you. Okay, if you're not keeping the logs unless unless you're specifically asked to. So, but if you have 200, 250 employees or more, then you know, at first on you're going to have to do your 300 day summaries, and then come uh, that should uh, uh, by June. Uh, on July 1st of 2018, you're going to have to provide 300 day summary, 300s to 300 day summaries and 301 or first report of injury forms. If uh, if you have it, if you're an employer that has 20, an establishment that has 20 to 249 employees, and and they've identified these 67 specific industries, which is you know if you're in manufacturing, you're covered. Okay, you're construction, you're covered. Okay, all these things. There's a list of all those that are covered. Then you're going to have to start reporting on, Jan on June 1st of this of next year. You're going to have to file your 300-day summaries. You know, it's important, but you got to do that. So, all right, here's the uh, on the on the emphasis programs. You got national emphasis program, the special emphasis program. You got regional emphasis programs. I put some of these in here, and I'm just going to get like the poultry one is a is that's a uh, well they, that's a special emphasis program you know, the, under the inspection guidelines, but then there's region four and region six have specific, uh, regional emphasis programs on in inspecting uh, uh, poultry processing plants. But these are some of the ones, as you can see here, these are the national emphasis programs. So if they come into your facility, they may try to expand the inspection beyond the what complaint inspection into a wall to wall based on these. Now, once again, you've got to understand your rights, and this I can't go into this thing. This is a whole webinar just on how to handle an ocean inspection. You're knowing your legal rights during an ocean inspection, uh, but you really need to be limiting as best you can if you've got a complaint inspection, 
but you got have had amputations or you're dealing with any of these other things, them expanding this into a wall-to-wall -wall inspection. So uh, it's very critical to know that. Uh, on these inspections, like on the, this is the one on, uh, this, uh, well, this is different, PSM, these are the specific ones, temporary employees. If you've got temporary employees, you need to be know one thing, or actually a couple of things. First of all, uh, if you have to, if the ocean inspection inspector comes to your site or during the opening conference, they're going to say, "Do you have any temporary employees?" If the answer is yes, they're going to ask to see the contract with your, your company and the temporary employee provider, and they're going to ask to see the training that you've done to show the hazards, to explain the hazards to those employees, so they are aware of that. You know, so if, you know this is opening up the door to all kinds of stuff. Ergonomics. You got to be. What's happening here? And you got to be a little bit careful about what, know what's going on. If you have an inspection and they open up an ergonomics, they may not cite you, but they may give you what they call an ergo letter or a 5A1 letter. And the reason they're doing that is they're saying we think you have ergonomic hazards uh, or uh, other different hazards. I'm just not. But let's just talk about ergonomic. But we don't. We don't. We don't. Uh, we're not going to try to pursue this at this time. Um, but once you get that letter, you better be want to do one of two things. Make sure that you don't have any ergonomic ha issues or respond back noting that we disagree with their assessment that there's ergonomic hazards here. Because they use that when they come back at that site or any other of your sites, and they, then now they can say, you have knowledge that we thought that these were er ergonomic hazards and you did not address them, therefore we're going to cite you under the general duty clause for willful. And here's, the show, here's how we show knowledge. It's the letter we gave you back a year ago, all right? So you need to be aware about that. But here's some of these are the, some of the emphasis programs you've seen a lot on now. This was the most interesting thing here. OSHA put this out a little while ago, uh, within the last six months, I think, six, eight months. And um, they decided, because this goes back to the thing I mentioned at the very beginning, they've not increased the number, really increased the number of inspections uh, from what now to when I was there as head of OSHA. But, uh, so they need to figure out, well, I have to show some in particular, because that's what Congress wants to know, how many inspections do you do and that stuff. Well, now they said, well, we're going to sign, we're going to give credits, EU credits, uh, uh, on inspections that are done. <clears throat> now, Notice, look, the very top one, where you get the most brownie points. <coughs> Significant cases, cases of $100,000 or more plus fines. And then you see number two, the next one down, they get seven EU credits, brownie points. <coughs> it's for PSM inspections, process safety management. Now, I have a real problem with this because, to be quite frank, I can understand why you get seven credits for uh, process safety management. Because a PSM inspection is going to usually entail at least three, maybe four inspectors over a, four, a, a two, three, four week, maybe a two months, three months time period. These are very heavily labor intensive inspections there. So I could understand, okay, we want to emphasize and say, okay, if you're doing a lot of PSM standards, we're going to give you credit for that. But a significant case, getting the most credits, Man, I can go into a site, uh, and we're going to have some of the handouts there. And I'm trying to remember if I had gave you the t uh, my my low 50, 25 low hanging fruit, or uh, what I consider easy things for OSHA to go after. If I go into a facility, I can myself probably find hundred thousand dollars in penalties just go on serious violations. And guess what? It's going to be a lot easier when it's now twelve thousand five hundred, because uh, then I only need ten or maybe even only nine, I, I don't do the math there, but anyway, it's nothing to get a significant case, and the number of significant cases has dramatically increased since I was there. I mean, dramatic, I'm, I'm going to say at least fivefold, maybe more. And so, to me, you can have one inspector going into a site for one day and get a significant case. That's, that, to me, all this is saying to the OSHA area directors is we want more significant cases and you're, we're going to, you're going to get brownie points for that and that's going to impact your, probably impact your bonus at the end of the year. So that's why I have a little bit of problems with that there. So anyway, temporary points, I think I've told you about these. I talked a lot about this. Um, you know, they're looking at are your temporary employees trained and are they treated like all the other employees there? Do they know the hazards associated with that? So, let 
You have to excuse me. I had to take some water here. Anyway, you're going to really need to look at your what your temporary employees. They should basically, and this is a hard thing. I know this is a hard thing. Because if you're going through, if you've got a temporary employee, that temporary employee, if you train him, he may not be there, he or she may not be there the next day. I understand that. But OSHA's going to be looking and say, what training did you do? And you cannot rely, if you're the host employer, you cannot rely on the temporary service provider doing the training. I'm telling you that right now. So you need to be aware of those type of things. If you're supervising them too, they go, their injuries and those go on your log. Don't fall for this thing that says sometimes you hear these temporary employee providers, oh, don't worry, we're going to do the 300 logs for you. That ain't happening. You're responsible for it, okay? So if you're supervising, you're, you, you know, now if somebody else is supervising, that's a whole different thing. But if the, if the temporary employee provider is supervising them, then, then they can have their own logs. But anyway, but we better see documentation on the training. We may make sure that they're they're being they 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 know the same hazards that that uh, that our hourly our regular employees know. All right. Um, like I say, they've been focusing on uh, record keep uh, the entire corporation in that the internal record keeping system. They're looking at that. They're looking at um, severe by the severe. This is severe violence enforcement (SCVP). Severe SBAT SBAT. I guess is what they call it. Severe Violators Enforcement Program. They've actually expanded that program. The number of companies that are in there has really dramatically increased. We had a similar program when I was there, but they revamped it and have made it very anonymous there. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that there. Questions about corporate identity. You're going to, when they're doing an inspection, they're going to ask for, they want to know who your parent companies are or who your subsidiaries are because they're using that to look and see, have you received other citations from those areas? so they can go after repeat violations. Because it's a lot easier, the reason they do that is because the burden of proof on a repeat violation is very s s small for OSHA. So they're gonna be looking at, that's why they ask you for your thing. Uh, they're gonna look for government tie-in contracts there, the government contracts, the, the Obama executive order talks about, you know, uh, you're gonna have to, uh, starting next, I guess it's either the end of this year or beginning of next year, you're going to have to start reporting all your OSHA violations, all your EEOC violations, all those type of things. There's like 20 standards that that executive order covers. And then they're going to determine whether or not you can bid on a government contract. OSHA is very focused on this joint employer idea. It's kind of more like a, a multi-employer citation policy, but in a... Um, on corporate-wide settlements, they're talking about add-ons uh, uh, when they're doing all these things. I do not, you know, you may be asked about doing a corporate-wide settlement if you're in an ocean inspection. I don't like them. I don't allow my clients to do them. Uh, I don't see any advantage to them, to be quite frank. Some people do, but I don't. And they've been asking the courts for corporate-wide abatement there instead of just the one site. They're asking when they, OSHA, when there's a contest for the citation, OSHA is saying, well, we think this, this hazard is present at all the companies for sites, and we want OSHA Review Commission judge to uh, issue an order that they have that they have to base that at all their facilities. I don't know if that, that will have to stand legal challenge, but it's what they're asking. What can I say? And there has been some, they've been pushing for this. And I think there was one case that they actually did grant that, so we'll have to see. Now, there's a new field operation manual that they've made it much more uh, much more extensive there. And you should be, that's a tool for you to need to look at to say, you know what they're doing on, what they should be doing on inspections. And of course, the state plans are under a lot of pressure from the feds to make sure that they issue more citations, bigger penalties, go after people criminally, all those type of things. Here's the uh, corporate-wide settlements I talked to you about there. Uh, that 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 they they went they agreed to them and they've been enforcing them. Uh, OSHA's been pushing on ergonomics for corporate wide settlements, particularly in the healthcare industry. So that's one thing you're seeing that. Supervisor and employee misconduct. The reason I put these in here, these are two fairly new cases. Uh, uh, the first one there, Contram. This was a really great decision for employers. Uh, it basically said that. And you have this situation. Unfortunately, I deal with this a fair amount. I mean, and the employee misconduct defense is very critical in a lot of cases because, to be quite frank, that's sometimes the only defense that the employer has, that the employee 
violated company policies, did some type of mis misconduct, and that's why we had the hazard. That's why we had the violation in the first place. It wasn't the company's fault. But sometimes we have supervisors uh, uh, also uh, doing employee misconduct. They're, they're not following the other rules that we have, and they are always. It was always a harder burden to prove if you had a, for the employer to prove the defense if it was a supervisor. But Contran came out and basically said that if a supervisor is violating company policy and causing creating a safety hazard uh, and gets OSHA citations, that that uh, that knowledge of the supervisor about the violation is not imputed to the company. See, normally, and in, in, in all rec in all cases, uh, OSHA looks to management supervisors, managers uh, to provide the, to impute their knowledge to the company to as to assess a violation or to be able to cite an employer. The Comtran case said that supervisors, if the supervisor is the only person doing the misconduct, then that that is not that if, that knowledge by that supervisor is not imputed to the company and therefore you can establish the employee mis supervisor misconduct defense. The second case, Quinlan, that kind of came after that and referenced Comtran and they basically said we want to clarify what we have here and what we have here is that um, that this uh, that if you have a supervisor and an hourly employee doing the misconduct that each knows that they're doing it and the supervisor does nothing, then that knowledge by the supervisor is imputed to the company and can form the basis of a of, of, of support of a violation and is not used as a defense. So that these two cases were very important there. Uh, repeat violations, this is another thing I want to keep moving because we've got a lot to going on here. Uh, once again, um, these OSHA's focus is on that because it really is easier to prove a repeat violation than anything else. So, um, so you need to be knowing. You need to know when all your OSHA past OSHA citations, and a repeat violation can go back five years. They can look at the citation history for five years. So anything beyond five years cannot be used in the repeat violation. But you know when OSHA comes on the site, I can tell you the inspector will have already looked at your history, your, your OSHA history, and if you've had citations, they're going to be looking specifically for them so that they can issue a repeat violation. Uh, you know, and once I said, uh, you know, it's up to 70,000 and come August it'll be 125,000. So, and here's some of the fines. I'm not going to, I mean, but it's clearly they're, they are very, very much focused on repeat violations right now because it's so easy and they can get big money. All right. Uh, and here's routine items that you may have that it makes it easier. Blocked exits, four-click operators, missing labels on kind of holes and switch, extension cords, temporary wiring, uh, using temporary wiring where permanent wiring is required, uh, ferry to document training, damage, temporary employees on site, all these things here at the end. So uh, now we're talking a little bit about the general duty clause. And this is one area that OSHA has really focused a lot on recently, uh, trying to, particularly in ergonomics, workplace violence, combustible dust. Uh, because there is no specific standard, OSHA standard on that, so they have to do that. So. Um, you know, like I said, on a, on a, uh, if you have a specific standard, you know, you have to show there's a hazard, at the standard applies, that there's exposure, and that the, new, the employer knew of, this, of the violation or with the exercise of reasonable diligence could have known of the violation. It should say, should be known of the, of the violation, not the citation. So, anyway, here's the general duty clause. It's in the act. Uh, you're supposed to, every employee is required to furnish an employee. Uh, each of his place of employment, place of employment are free from recognized hazards causing or likely to cause death or serious injury. So these are, and then this is what OSHA must prove in the violation. You know, the condition exists, that the employer recognized or the industry recognized the hazard and the, like, the hazard would like to cause death or serious injury. Once again, this is a much easier burden of proof to meet here. And here's what OSHA looks at with respect to uh, industry recognition consensus standards that the industry has been involved with, site safety plans, structure of state, state and local codes, manufacturers' warnings, uh, NIOSH CDC recommendations, uh, trade associations, you know, uh, other things that you're, you're tied into may, may establish that this is some type of, that the industry recognizes this. So, 
uh, with respect to the employer has recognized this as a hazard, you're going to look at safety rules, memorandums, grievances, and out root cause analysis, accident investigations, previous OSHA inspections. Uh, all these things put the employer on notice that this is a hazard and therefore they need to address it. So, um, and that it's, a, it's a common sense type of thing. Is a reasonable person, would a reasonable person recognize that this was a hazard? So, anyway. Uh, and here I have some other ones. This, and you're going to get a copy of this, so I'm not going. To, I'm going to kind of go through these things. Uh, but you can see some of these things. The forks without seatbelts. You know, these are different things that possibly could be used uh, for 5A1 violations to establish knowledge, show that they have knowledge. These are, things, like I say, past violations that they've cited under this standard. So, because on the seatbelt, on the forklift, there's no, uh, there's no specific standard. So. Uh, combustible dust, this once again, there's no combustible dust standard, but they're looking at the, the site the employers under 5A1, general duty clause, and knowledge. Now the question is, so how are we at knowledge about combustible dust? Well, guess what? You know, we had the changes in this global harmonization on the, uh, the, on the, on the HASCOM standard. And one of those changes was that we have a new safety data sheet as opposed to the material safety data sheet, right? And now we have them, and we were supposed to, on June 1st, review all those things. And guess what they required to include on that OSHA, which was not in the standard when I, reviewed, when I was looking at this. I, this was, this was, uh, this was, I was, it was at my uh, office when I looked, when I, before I left. This was the combustible dust portion of it. They added that combustible dust requirement for the safety data sheets. Uh, and because that's just why they wanted it, because they weren't going to be able to have a combustible dust standard. So they figured, how are we going to build site employers for combustible dust? Well, this is going to include it on a requirement on our safety data sheets that they have to list any combustible dust there. And so now we have the manufacturer identifying this as a combustible dust and also have explosiveness and those things and flammability and all this other stuff. And it's in our new safety data sheets, and we're required to review our safety data sheets, so we have knowledge about it there. So now we can be cited under under uh, under general duty clause. Be able to say, and they say you knew this was uh, you had combustible dust materials because it's in your safety data sheet. And you're supposed to be reviewing those, and it's supposed to be actually doing a hazard new hazard assessment to determine what hazards are there. And it's in the safety data sheet, so you have, it's easy to show knowledge. And the fact that you reviewed it and didn't do anything or didn't review it, that might be willful. So now we're talking about a willful violation. So. Uh, but that's what the, that's how this is used. That's why they put the combustible dust requirement in the safety data sheet for, and in the global harmonization changes to the, and, and, and required to be part of the safety data sheet. That's why that was there. And, um, what you need to be doing? Well, you need to really look at this thing. Look at what has what chemicals you do, what substances you do have. Look on your SDSs. Uh, is this anything that's combustible? And how do we handle that? And then we need to, you know, do we have a hazard assessment where how we're going to address those, how we're going to handle those things, how we're going to avoid having any type of uh, explosion. So ergonomics, as I uh, noted to you, there's been a big push on OSHA always wanted, uh, in this administration, has really wanted to do something on ergonomics. The Clinton administration had an ergonomic standard that was thrown out in the first two weeks, I think, or three weeks of the Bush administration. So, um, they, uh, but so they figured, well, we can't do that, but we got, but, but once again, it's always the knowledge issue. How does employer, how can you show the employers had knowledge that OSHA considered er this ergonomics problem an issue for that company? Well, what they to do now, they sent all last year, they sent out to all the hospital administrators in the country um, and uh, created a website and told them about that they said that this, you know, here we just want to let you know we consider this to be a ergonomics problems. And now you're put on notice. So they got their, their 5A1 letter, basically, what I call them 5A1 letters. And now they're put on notice. This makes it a lot easier if they come in, if they find that you haven't done anything, they can say, well, look, you knew it was a hazard because we sent you the letter. You didn't object to it, didn't say it wasn't, so you knew it and you didn't do anything about it. Therefore, we might have a general duty clause violation for ergonomics and we might consider it willful because you did nothing about it, even after we sent you the letter. So you need to be aware of those type of things and need to be, maybe be responding back to those, indicating we do not believe that these are ergonomics issues or hazards or whatever, but anyway. 
Um, I'm going to go kind of through these things real quick. Here's some of the top 14 occupations with musculoskeletal disorders. Some of them, uh, you know, you find in almost every, uh, uh, some are really specific, others are general that you'll find in a lot of companies. So I'll just do that there. Also, uh, I put in here just for your, you can go online on the OSHA website, www.osha.gov, and pull all this stuff up. So don't, it's right there for your, for your, anytime you need it. But it gives you good guidelines on this. Maybe it doesn't, you know, maybe you don't have one on your specific industry, but we could, you can use these are great guidelines for that. So, uh, so I'm just going to run through that. You're going to have these when you get the handouts. This will be part of the handouts. As with uh, a couple other things, I think our ocean inspection checklist, great checklist. I think we have your 13 strategies. Uh, I think we also including the uh, worksheet for record keeping. That worksheet for record keeping is really, really good. I and mean, I'm not patting myself on the back because I, one of my uh, former associates uh, who went in house with a company, she put it together and she did an excellent job. We give this, we, we provide this to our clients and our friends. I get rave reviews from our clients that do the people that do these record keeping. They say, "Oh man." I, we use that, and we know exactly what it is. If you use that form, if you have a question on a record, whether something should be recorded or not, <clears throat> on your 300 logs, use this form. It's like four pages long, and once you go through it, I, you know, 99% of the time, I can't say 100% of the time, but or maybe we should say 95% of the time, you're going to get it exact. You're going to get it right. Okay. So make look at those things there on that. So let's keep moving here. Um, Here's the basics of what they have to prove that there's an ergonomic has exist, that it was recognized, uh, and the recognized once again is that the letters they sent out. So was it cause or likely cause this or physical error, and there are feasible means of bait to reduce it. So that's 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 the OSHA's burden of proof, and the biggest one is recognized hazard. So you know we did it. So anyway, um, you can see where they're issuing citations under general duty for these things here. Uh, once again, I said if they if they find an ergonomic hazard, but they don't can't show that the, somehow that the employer knew about it, then they're going to send you this 5A1 hazard alert, and uh, now you're going to have the knowledge for them to come back again. They may come back six months later. Now they can issue a citation for that against you. So you need to be addressing these issues there. You know, um, I don't like the way on on the ergonomics thing. Uh, once again, I don't think they understand how the system works. They're not. Uh, I just don't think they, they're training. They don't really have good training for the inspectors on on ergonomics issues, and they start throwing these things around when it, uh, that there's ergonomic issues when they really don't know exactly what it is. So, and of course, they really are trying to establish industry recognition. The hospital industry right now, particularly in nursing care, all home care, all that stuff, they're trying to focus on that. So, and um, like I say, it's very hard. Um, you know, they're they're very serious about these things. Um, uh, you know, you can fight them pretty easily, I think, there. They don't understand. I don't, sometimes I, I wonder if they really understand the nylosh lifting equations. Um, but OSHA is big on engineering con con changes, and they don't really understand how they – they just kind of throw stuff out and make recommendations what they think, even though they probably don't have any background in the, in the, in the industry or in the in business world anyway. Uh, getting ahead of cares on ergonomics, this is what we need to be doing. You should be looking at those things. You should be analyzing jobs. We need to have a program in place, uh, do the real training, uh, and make sure that the employees are monitoring and enforcing our, our safety, our good work safety practices. So, workplace violence, obviously this is a big issue, um, is, is, and unfortunately I'm afraid it's going to become, continue to get bigger. Um, uh, they have OSHA has the guidance for healthcare. Uh, the intricate case talked about workplace violence and finding violations. Speedway talked about employees that were by themselves open open to potential uh, attacks. Those are the things that they're looking at there. So, uh, you know, on the active shooter scenario, Department of Homeland Security and uh, FBI, they have these their their, their recommendations. They uh, fight or flight. And actually, it's, it's 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 flight first. Then it's if you can't leave the prop, if you can't get away from the active shooter, in, in flight, then the next thing to do is hide and try to get uh, protect yourself. If you can't do that, now they're saying 
you really need to be prepared to fight yourself as best you can. Uh, if, if if you can't hide in the in the things, you need to be looking at something that how you can attack, how you can defend yourself, or try to uh, uh, you know. And they're talking about use of fire extinguishers is probably the one that they're fo most focused on. But you need to be able to do that. We should have an emergency action plan. It's not required in most cases, but I'm a big proponent of emergency action plans, and I think you should have those in place to be able to do that. So. <clears throat> um, you know, once again, it's the criminal focus is is, is there, but uh, it's a little bit hard right now. But you got to understand, there's been a lot, number of criminal charges been brought against companies for violation of, of OSHA standards. So, and, and and mostly when you have deaths involved, but uh, you really need to be a little bit careful about this thing. That you need to be, make sure we're doing, we're we're focusing on making sure we're in compliance with every area that we can. Um, Bad facts make bad law. Unfortunately, the, the, the temporary employee provider case was just, there was a really bad case. Um, and uh, it, or it looked bad anyway, and I, and I actually handled the case. Um, it, the company actually had a really great safety program. A couple of things fell between the cracks. We were dealing with a temporary employee. We, we, had to, we were advised by the temporary employer provider that they were doing the training. We had provided a, a PowerPoint to them uh, on the hazards. Turned out they weren't doing it. So, you know, it's, uh, but they're very much focused on temporary things. Uh, also, they, I can say they have a, depart, a justice, de uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Justice Department on uh, pro uh, uh, going on doing more criminal cases on safety. It was, the J Department of Justice really kind of shied away from them. They may do look at, they probably look at three or four cases, maybe five cases a year, but I think that's now changing and they're looking much more aggressively at this thing. Uh, and of course, if you're involving a false testimony or destroying evidence, um, you're gonna, that's, if you wanna be, if you wanna get a criminal charge brought against you or an investigation, falsify testimony, give false testimony, destroy evidence, change evidence, whatever. That's the best way to do it. And you got to say, if I'm going to do this, do I really look good in orange? Um, but we're, I can say we're doing that. I told you about uh, the focus that OSHA has put on it with their regional administrators on contacting all the U.S. attorneys and the uh, attorney generals. Uh, so they've been doing that. But uh, here, if you're going to have, uh, you have to have an employer under the OSHA criminal standard, you had to, for them to do a criminal action, you had to have an employer that violated the OSHA standard that caused the death of the employee that was willful. Uh, and of course, you got to prove beyond a reasonable doubt there is a, it's a much higher burden than in the civil action things there. And of course, there's been a number of cases, you probably heard about the Bumblebee case, that, oh, that was one of them, but there's been a whole number of local prosecutions uh, of, uh, for, for safety violations. So. Um, and I have there about the Yates memo. Uh, this is something if you know there's some viol if if an employee has violated some things or have done false statements that under the Yates memo, you're going to have to be the company has to fully cooperate. And if you don't, then they may still bring actions against you. So uh, there's been some real criticism about that from a legal standpoint. But anyway, that is what's out there right now. Um, you know, once again, corporate liability, you're going to be, corporations can be vicariously liable. Uh, and then, of course, the corporate officers can be held liable. Uh, um, and the question is, are they, if they're aware or not aware of the, uh, uh, of the misconduct? So you're going to have to be looking at that. I'm, I'm not going to go through this thing, but this kind of the, how fatality cases, how they go around, how they do what they deal with there. Okay, you can see that uh, on that. Uh, it, talk about federal, 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 state, and local laws on criminal. The more likely criminal actions are going to come from the state because they have a lot more different types of criminal actions, and they have a, a, they're more inclined to take those cases. So, uh, here's obstruction of justice. I'm just, I'm just going to just talk about that. You can see here, five years in prison, uh, a fine, and five years imprisonment corrupting, uh, threatening letters, communication, somehow trying to influence, to turn, tell people not to get, not to tell the truth or stuff like that. You got to be really careful about this thing here. Um, destroying, altercation, falsification of records, knowing, all or destroying, mutilating, concealing, cover up, false entries, any records, documents, tangible, intent to impede, that's going to get you potentially 20 years in prison. 
mail fraud, if you're providing stuff through the mail, they may take that as a to OSHA or to other government agencies. They can use that as a as a way if, if the information is false that they can say that you're using the mail to defraud the government. Uh, conspiracy, we have two or more people involved and in trying to uh, you know they may look there and say we're trying to defraud the agency. And from an OSHA standpoint, we got you know managers and a site saying we're going to or or company officials saying well we're going to we're not going to we're not going to uh, provide or we're going to alter this evidence here so that they get the wrong evidence and think that. And that's going to open them up to conspiracy accounts. So, all right, um, Eric, I don't know if we have any questions, but uh, uh, what I would say here is um, uh, I appreciate once again, we're right at the, but I, I would say thank you for everybody that's participated on this. Uh, that uh, it really is important things that you're doing to help people go home safe and sound each night to their families and loved ones. So, uh, do we have any questions, Eric? You know? Yeah, we had a couple questions come in, so I can go ahead and read those off to you, and you can just um, take them as, as I go through them. Does that sound good? Good. All right, so the first one's from Eugenia. She said, do all size employers need to comply with OSHA rules? Um, the answer is yes. I mean, there is a provision 582 of the Act, uh, 581 is the, the general duty code. 582 talks about employees following the rules and stuff like that. Now, and, and when I was head of OSHA, you know, I used to get employers groups to come, or employers, especially small employers, and say, you know, an employee was violating the rules. Why don't you cite them? Well, that ain't ever going to happen. So, but uh, there is a requirement, and of course, you should have your 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 own safety rules. And if they violate them, you need to have you need to have your you know document a list of what I can call safety rules. It doesn't have to be all encompassing, but you should have those things in place. And then you should have a documented uh, disciplinary policy. It might be progressive discipline, you know, oral warning, written warning, suspension, termination. However you have it, it doesn't really matter. It's up to each employer. But uh, you need to have those things in place so that when people when employees do violate the rules. Or as, as far as your training, the training saying this is how we do things. If you don't follow this, they violated the tr our policy on say lockout tagout or confined space or or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But we need to, you know. So we, if they're violating our policies or if they're violating our our safety rules, we should have a, you know. And depending how serious they are, you know, if they're, they're a fighting or bringing a gun to work or something like that, we should have rules against work guns in the workplace. Um, and say, you know, you violate our policy. Uh, this is an egregious matter. We have the right to terminate your immediate termination. We don't have to go through the progressive discipline, but you've got to have those things in place and then document it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Cheryl. It's a little more specific. Do all industries with 250 plus employees have to report or these? 67 specified industries with 250 plus employees only. No, the 250 at an establishment, and this is just at one plant. Now let's just make sure we got that clear. It's not total employees for the whole company. But if you have a site, and and that they're called establishments under the record keeping lingo, then you have um, you have to. There's two things here. If you have 250 employees at one site and you are not partially exempt, if you're not, you know, and that goes back to the, the you got 80 some, 82 I think, companies that are partially exempt under subpart uh, appendix A of subpart B of the of record keeping standard. So if you're partially exempt from the record keeping requirements, even if you have over 250 employees. You're not required to keep the log, so you can't, you can't, you can't do it. Now, it does have a provision that says that if OSHA or the BLS asks you to keep it, then you would probably ha have to provide that information to OSHA. But, uh, but if, but if you normally keep, if you're, you're not partially exempt, and you got 250 or more employees, then you're going to have to report the, uh, report your, your now the next year your 300-day summary, but the following year. 
your 300 log information and your 301 support information and the 308 summary. If you have 20 to 4249, then you have and you have to be on that list, okay? And this is a broad list. I mean, one of the is manufacturing. So if you got 200, two, say you got 25 employees in your manufacturer, you're still going to have to report start uh, in uh, July 1st of next year your your 300 day summary. Now that's the only thing that that you know all you're asked there is to report your summary data for the 220 to 249. That doesn't change, so it's not going to be. But still, that's a, a lot of companies are going to be covered under that. So. Okay, and then a, a follow-up question to that: Does the 250 mean per location or per IEN or EIN for reporting purposes? If you should be maintaining. If you're not partially exempt from the OSHA record keeping standard, then you're required to keep your 300 logs and also do the 300 day summaries and post them on February 1st of the following year until April 30th. Um, and that 300 log is by establishment. That means just your, if you've got 10 plants, you've got 10 different establishments and you have to have 10 different 300 logs and 10 300, uh, 300 day summaries. Okay. There is some allowance for if they're uh, if they're right next to each other and they have the same management and the same policy and procedure, you can sometimes join them. But that you have to jump through a bunch of hoops to do that. So. Okay, Ed. Uh, if I could just have you flip forward two slides in case anyone's here. We got maybe two more questions here. Um, but for the, yeah, just put the SHRM and HRCI in case anybody's here for that, just so they can get them. Um, okay, another question. Regarding SDS, there are still many manufacturers who haven't updated their information. Are we still held responsible? No, you're allowed to keep your MSDSs until, you, uh, until they get replaced. Uh, so I don't have it. Um, they, they, uh, it was, was it July or January, excuse me, was it June, it was either June or August, I think it was June of last year, is when we switched, when the manufacturers had to stop sending MSDS and start doing SDS and have their labels updated. And if, if, you know, if you get, if you get a, um, if you get an SDS, a new SDS for a chemical that you've been using that you have an, S, uh, an MSDS, I would say you want to replace that. But let me tell you something. Please, please keep all your MSDSs, your old MSDSs. You need to keep them. First of all, under the record keeping, uh, medical record keeping, 1910-1020, those are they're the medical, uh, they're, uh, they're medical exposure records. Therefore, you're supposed to be keeping them for 30 years. But it's even more important because the, you got S, MSDSs do not have the detailed information that the SDSs have. Now, let's just assume that you got an employee you got, uh, that, was, that used to work for you five years ago, okay? And he was exposed to this one chemical that you have, uh, that you have the MSDS. Now, Fast, and now you got, uh, and the MSDS never noted any any specific hazard or something like that, or, or noted some small hazards, but nothing big. And now the new SDSs show, say, oh, this is cancer causing and and uh, really bad stuff. But this guy's already left. He was worked for you five years ago, and left, you know, left several years ago, um, and you haven't heard from him for like two or three years. Okay. Now the SDSs say you got this cancer hazard that was not identified in the MSDSs. And now, five years later from now, he brings a lawsuit against you for, for negligence um, because now he has cancer and he thinks he got it because of that. You need to be able to point. The question, once again, is knowledge on negligence, on even a tort action. You still have to show knowledge. So you have to, if you have the MSDSs, they may not have, they may show, listen, this is what we knew. This is the only thing we had was MSDS, and this didn't say one thing about this being cancerous. 
yes, the new MS, the new SDS says that it's can they, they think it's cancerous, but we didn't know that when he was here. And that should be, you need that defense. That's why you got to keep these things. You got to keep all this MSDSs for 30 years. Okay? Please do that. When you change, when you put a new SDS in, keep the MSDS. That's my best advice. Okay, sounds good. We have two more questions, and I think they're pretty good. So if you could get to those, and then we'll shut it down. Sound good, Ed? Yep. Okay. So the next question is: You said not to use their form if an employee, not to use OSHA's form if an employee is hospitalized for amputation, eye loss, or treatment. What form do you advise we use to send them? Um, okay, I'm. Uh, the only time you're going to get their form, it's called the rapid response form. This is only when they'll send it to you when you have a hospitalization of one employee. Because they're trying to decide, should we go out and inspect this site or not? It does have, it, when you call them in on an amputation, they're going to be coming in. They're not going to send you any form. On the loss of an eye, I don't think, they're not going to send you a form, I don't think. They may, they may send this response form. I'm just saying, on the rapid response, if they just, when you call in the hospitalization of one employee and they're trying to decide where they come, they're going to send you this form, ask you to do an accident investigation. I want you to do the accident investigation, but when you get the information from them, I would just give them, this is what we conducted in investigation, this is what we found, you know, and, here's, and, and, and this is how we addressed it. You know, they've got, they ask for a lot of things that basically ask for admissions that open you up to viola uh, potential violations. I always want to keep it very short and sweet. Here's what we did. We did the investigation. Here's what we found. Uh, and, and, and if any issues came up, here's how we addressed it. And leave it at that. Very short and sweet. Okay, thanks. Uh, one more question, and that's what wordage would make procedures for reporting work-related injuries and illnesses as re reasonable. We have always used the report immediately in our company in multiple policies and trainings. On the on the uh, on our policy on the on our pr procedure for advising employees how to report injuries and illnesses. If you're saying it's immediate, I, I'm pretty sure we're going to be coming out for our clients, we're going to be coming out and talking to them or, or providing some type of information on what, how this should, how it should. But I can tell you right now, if you read in the preamble of the changes that came on this electronic um, changes to, uh, or the changes to the record keeping for electronic filing and the other provisions basically under 1904.35, that's where they talk about this being reasonable. They, in the preamble, talk about immediate, and they still do not believe that immediate is reasonable. So if you have a, a policy, if you're enforcing a policy and said you didn't report it, you, you didn't re somebody had, gets injured and they don't report it immediately, they report it the next day, and you discipline them because under that policy, I guarantee you open yourself up to, first of all, OSHA inspection and getting cited under 1904.35, and at the same time, they're going to encourage that person to file a whistleblower claim under Section 11C. Okay, great. Uh, just, Ed, could you flip back one slide, please? That wraps up the Q&A, or forward, yeah. Um, just wanted to mention the Workplace Safety and Health Guide that's written by Ed Folk. Um, got a lot of great information in it. Thanks, Ed, for coming on today. We really appreciate it. I'm happy to do it. And the, the manual has a lot of, the nice thing about the manual, there's, there are attached, we got a lot of appendix there, and there's stuff in those appendix that you can't find anyplace else, to be quite frank. So. Great. Um, just flip over to the last slide, Ed. This one? Yeah, there we, yeah, there we go. That's got uh, Ed's information. It's got um, the info at HR Simple, but you can also send to me, Eric, E-R-I-C-K, at HR Simple if you have any questions. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending today. Um, if you need anything, let us know. Ed, do you have any final words before we sign off here? Uh, no, just, I just say, once again, thank you for your commitment.
Center for Safety and Health, uh, and uh, appreciate the, your interest in, in the program today. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. For HRSimple.com, Ed Folk, and Fisher Phillips, thank you for attending. We hope you come out again. Have a great day.